Hey there, it's Crash Connell. Fresh new podcast today on the calendar, Tuesday, October 3rd, 2023. Mary Danielson back at the uh, host mic. Yes, a new month, uh, beautiful weather we're having still until we're not anymore. So <laughs> my guest today is Philip Zodiades, and he has quite a story to tell that really underscores the perils of coming against some of the more radical agendas that are shaping our nation and our world his father was Spiros Zodiades, passed away in 2009, and some of you might recognize the name from the Hebrew-Greek Key Study Bibles. Uh, this has been one of my favorite Bibles for a long time, the key feature being that each word in both the Old and New Testaments is marked with its Strong's Concordance reference number. So you can do word studies of any word in the scriptures. It's right at your fingertips. I've grown to love it greatly. Uh, it's been a huge blessing to a lot of Bible students, and I'm going to speak to Philip shortly. But first, our scripture for today is Romans 5, 1 to 5, and it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Well, wow, that's a lot of good news right there. Would you pray with me this morning? Oh, Lord, our hearts are often heavy as we watch the world descend into wickedness on so many levels. We long to see the day when you rule and reign in righteousness. Thank you for the promise of hope that sustained us, sustains us until that day, Lord. Help us to be patient and to persevere, to be about your work, Lord, and to just trust you for the results. We ask for that extra measure of faith uh, and grace, a lot of grace, Lord, to finish well and help us to be sensitive to your leading toward those in our lives who desperately need you. Give us tender hearts towards those who suffer and help us to understand how we can minister your love and grace. I lift up Philip to you and thank you for his boldness and patience in suffering. Protect him and his family and meet their needs as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, my guest, Philip Zodiades. He was, he's a successful businessman with a long career in marketing, publishing, and copywriting, and with a heart for missions and a love for truth. He speaks to churches and small groups pertaining to preparing ourselves for the coming persecution of Christians and you are about to understand why that is important in these days because he's been through an awful lot in these last several years. So we're going to hear his story, and I'm going to give you some links to support him as we go. Philip, welcome to Stand Up for the Truth. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Well, this is, a, this is about a story that's been going on for about 13 years, and I'm going to give some background here with Philip's permission, and then he's going to jump in and tell you his story. Now, this story centers around uh, two women— Lisa Miller and Janet Jenkins, beginning in 1998. And all this is all online, so the, the names and everything are online. At that time, they entered into a lesbian relationship. Now, originally from Virginia, at one point they traveled to Vermont on vacation, and they entered into a civil union, which was legal in Vermont at that time. We're talking the year 2000. And then they returned to their lives in Virginia. Now, Lisa had decided she had wanted a child, and so she underwent artificial insemination in 2001, and that resulted in a daughter being born in 2002, and her name was Isabella. The birth certificate showed one name, one parent, Lisa Miller. This is important to remember. Now, for various reasons, the union had to be dissolved due to continuing uh, relationship issues and abusive behavior from Janet. So they were a couple no more by 2003. Now, what about Isabella and all this? The important thing to note is that during this time when Isabella was still only one, Lisa had given her life to Christ and she had left that lifestyle. And I want to just interject a real brief uh, side story. I've often wondered myself about what happens to these uh, homosexual unions or marriages as they refer to when a relationship ends. What kind of parental rights does a partner have over children that they are not biologically related to, or maybe they have not even adopted it. <clears throat> I mean, it's always difficult for children being products of divorce, even with traditional marriages. But as we're going to see, um, being political pawns of furthering an agenda is a whole other thing. It's far more destructive. So anyway, at alarmingly, at one point, the ACLU and other LGBTQ rights groups took on the cause of, of Isabella's um, status 
even though Janet really didn't show any interest in Isabella. Now, these groups proceeded to fund Janet's custody battle for Isabella from 2003 to 2010. She was awarded unsupervised parental visits in 09, at which point Isabella would have been seven. Okay, Lisa allowed her daughter to visit Jenkins, even though she really didn't want to, but she was ordered to. But she came to believe that serious abuse was taking place during those visits due to changes in the child's behavior and her psyche. Uh, Isabella, uh, I mean, not Isabella, Lisa tried to stop the visits, but a liberal Vermont judge threatened to give full custody to the lesbian uh, activist ex-partner if she did. Uh, keep in mind, back in uh, 07, a Virginia Circuit Court recognized Lisa as Isabella's sole parent. And now this is where Philip enters the story, having given Lisa a ride from Virginia to Buffalo. And he knew that Lisa had full biological custody at this time, valid passports, was not violating any court orders. Um, anyway, Philip, I want you to fill in the rest of the blanks for us and sort of a start of a waking nightmare for you. Yeah. Well, I got a call out of the blue in 2009 um, from a frantic woman saying, hey, I understand you're the kind of person that help other people. Uh, will you help me? And uh, I was familiar with her story. I'd never met her or had never talked to her. And uh, my wife and I have always abided by uh, Proverbs 3, chapter 27. It says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. And so anytime anybody would come to us with a legitimate uh, request or a need, we would always open our our arms or our home or our pocketbook and we would help them. And that, that was, that's just our, what we believe God has called us all to do. And that's what we did. So, uh, I happened to be going to Buffalo anyway. And, uh, I did give her a ride to, uh, to, to New York and from Virginia. And, uh, for that, I was, uh, eventually arrested. Well, let me, backtrack a little bit in 2012 three years later i was hit with a civil suit and at the time it was driven by the aclu and lambda legal the mm. civil suit was basically uh, because i was uh myself and other people that were involved in helping lisa and lisa herself were denying janet jenkins her parental rights and that's what the civil suit was all about mm. then two years after that uh I was arrested uh, for a charge of international parental kidnapping and uh, in, in relation to this. And it turned out that the, uh, that the attorneys for the, that were handling the civil suit passed along all the discovery and all the emails and everything to the federal government, the Department of Justice. And uh, so I was I was arrested and charged. My trial was in 2016. I went to prison in 2018 and spent 29 months in prison. And that's that's basically what transpired. Wow. Wow. And and there was Lisa had said that she had not gotten effective counsel because the statute under which she was convicted herself allows a parent to remove her child from the country if she believes there's abuse involved. What? I mean, this and other things were conveniently swept under the rug. And as far as, you know, uh, el uh, allegations of abuse from Janet and all of that was um, was not even allowed. So <laughs> what are we looking at here? I mean, this is just incredible that that uh, um, counsel would not have brought these things up. What's your take on that? Well, obviously, they had an agenda and, and the, it started in Vermont with the uh, family court judge. And they were trying to push homosexual marriage on the rest of the country and basically nullify the marriage amendments. So, you know, eventually they got this with Obergefell. It just wiped out all of the marriage amendments. Uh, I, and that's debatable whether it actually did. But uh, we have seen that essentially that is what that is what has happened. And so um, they've continued on with this lawsuit now, even though. Uh, you know, we've served our sentences and all of this. And it's true that in every court case they have, in, including the criminal cases, they have swept the abuse under the rug and refused to allow it to be brought out in court. 
why there must be some sort of agenda. This is not a this has not been a gay rights issue. That is a mm-hmm. lie. They have perpetrated that. There's there's got to be more to it, especially since uh, it, it's continuing on even after they have gotten what they initially wanted. Mm-hmm. And so we have come to understand that what they're really trying to do is to normalize uh, sexual relations between adults and children. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is, uh, you know, we see this happening worldwide. The WHO is pushing it. The United Nations is, is, is pushing the decriminalization of adult child sex. We see Planned Parenthood International pushing it. You know, this, this is all on the record, and it's, it's becoming a worldwide movement. This is the next letter on the LBGTQ mm-hmm. uh, acronym. And it's coming, and they're going to use this case that uh, I'm a defendant in to push the envelope that far. And so that that's really what this is all about. And people are just naive. Uh, Congress is complicit because of their silence, and we've got to do something. Yeah. Um, let's go back a little bit and talk about Lisa. What actually how did that further progress? I mean, she did not stay in this country, and that, that's what really led to the international kidnapping thing. So how did, what happened after she got to Buffalo? Uh, she crossed the border in a taxi cab and uh, took a flight, she and her daughter, from Toronto to Central America. And it's my understanding, you know, I lost contact with her, of course, but uh, she was in Central America until... Uh, Isabella, her daughter, became of age and uh, became 18. And then uh, right before President Trump left office, she surrendered herself to the embassy in Nicaragua. And uh, she was transported by federal marshals here. She spent, I think, a year in jail waiting trial. Mm. Wow. And again, we want to reiterate that, that she had a valid passport for her and her daughter, and she was not violating any court order at the time. I mean, that's alarming um, to think that that everything was in order, basically, and and then to see what happened. That's that's just incredible. Now, you spent time, you said you spent time in a federal prison, and Mm -hmm. on the Internet, you you have a prison diary, and it's at, I'm going to give the address here, and then I'm going to kind of spell it out because um, there's numbers and and letters involved. So Romans 828, but it's Romans, and then you spell out 8, E-I-G-H-T, Romans 8, and then 28 is numbers. Romans828.com. And I, I read quite a few entries, and I was so impressed uh, with your patient endurance. Um, I mean, I know this was hard on your family, um, but I think, I mean, there are almost 900 entries, and you talk about just the Lord. Um, and all the things that, that he was doing with you, through you, in your midst. And I think, you know, how would we, any of us respond? It kind of gets your brain going. How would we respond to be separated from everything we know and those we love for something that is so unjust? I'd like you to take uh, just a few minutes or however long you want. And how did you see God's hand in your prison time? Well, I never believed I would be convicted. I mm. never thought I would lose my appeal. My my case went all the way to Supreme Court, and they denied to hear it. Mm. I never thought I would go to prison, but God had different plans. And you know, we can never we can never uh, second guess what God has for us. Yeah. And you know, having to self surrender to prison was a. It, I, I got to tell you, it was a difficult and a very frightening thing. You know, it was about a four and a half, five hour trip from home. Well, maybe four hours, excuse me. And, uh, you know, I got on the on the way that morning, I got five calls from different people uh, from all over the country. Some of them weren't even Christians. And they said, you know, Lord told me to tell you that you are Joseph for today. And so when I got there, I was questioning God. I asked, why God? Why, why am I here? What, what is, you know, I thought you were going to rescue me. Mm. But then I got to studying scriptures. You know, uh, the first place I turned to was the story of Joseph, and I read it. And uh, then I read Job, and I read Daniel, and I read <laughs> Jonah, and I read the uh, story of the Israelites. But 
uh, in reading Job, you know, Job was questioning God, asking him why, and what did God say in chapter 38 and I think 40? He said, gird up your loins. When I read that, it was God telling me, suck it up, Philip, <laughs> you know, <laughs> be a man. And so I I realized, then I started reading the New Testament, and I I recognized reading through the New Testament, what I had was time. I had a lot of time. Sure. And I recognized that God never promised to keep us from suffering and persecution. It's just the opposite. God promises that he says in Second Timothy, indeed, all who want to live in a godly way in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We will be persecuted, all of us. So we have to be prepared for this. And I'm here to say it's, it's not as bad, you know, God will walk through you with it. He, God may not promise to, to keep us from it, but he will be with us every step of the way. Mm -hmm. So there's four things I came to recognize that I had to do. I had to consecrate myself to the Lord and rejoice in my circumstances. We see this, uh, Jesus said, rejoice in, in Matthew 5, 10, 11. Rejoice when you're persecuted for my name's sake. James said this. Paul said this. Peter said this. So I recognized that I had to do this. I had to rely 100% on God's protection and power. And I had to not be ashamed, to be bold in my witness. I had to be patient and wait on the Lord and for his will and his work to be done. So I, I, I recognized that I had to totally surrender my circumstances to the Lord. And what happened was when I walked into my cell and met my cellmate, He's a big, tall, black guy, and he was asleep on the bottom bunk. And he he woke up and he said, I've been having this reoccurring dream that this middle-aged or older white man would, would walk into my cell and change my life forever. Wow. And I thought, wow. wow. <laughs> then the next guy I met was in the cell next to me, who a, a young guy who introduced himself. And I, he, you know, the first thing people ask is, why are you here? And I told him my story. And he said, wow, God put you here so you can help disciple me because I just became a Christian. Wow. Then I met, the, the next guy I met was a, uh, a former gangster who come to the Lord with a miraculous story three years earlier. And he said, God put me, you here to teach me the Bible. So immediately I had a Bible study. Hmm. And. It went during COVID, it, it, uh, we were all locked in ourselves and locked in. We, uh, there was a fellow who miraculously came to know the Lord. He was the biggest uh, doper in the, in the unit. And uh, he went and asked the guard if he could study the Bible with me in my cell. And the guard, you know, because COVID, we weren't allowed in each other's cells, the guard gave him permission. And that turned into a church that met every night with anywhere from eight to 15 guys crammed into a seven by nine foot. Oh. cell. so God had a purpose for me being there. Yeah. And it was, it was a, it was actually a wonderful experience. It was a hard experience during COVID. I didn't get to see my family for a year. Uh, but you know, I learned to rejoice in my circumstances. Wow. Yeah. No wonder the blog is called Romans 828.com. All things work together for the good. Um, I mean, it's just incredible, and I suppose they wanted to know your story because you were you were in a federal penitentiary. I guess I'm I'm a little surprised by that. It wasn't even. a penitentiary. It was, okay. it was a it was a low. It was a correctional institution. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and and some of the like you had mentioned, some of the other people were in there for much worse things than than what you did, and actually you were convicted for for you know doing the right thing, but. Um, I, I bet just getting some of their stories was just an incredible thing. Can you think of one thing that really stands out? I mean, everything you've mentioned so far is just so neat to hear about. Is there one conversion or one thing in particular that really stands out to you that, that was just the hand of the Lord? There, there, yeah, there's 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 many. You know, don't give up on people. Yeah. Um, I gave up on some people, and then I see them miraculously turn to the Lord and uh, God can redeem anybody, you know, r r rapists, child molesters, uh, gangsters, you know, the the drug lords. I mean, I've 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 seen these people come to the to the Lord, and I've seen God transform their lives, 
and we've got to be patient with them and work with them and, and recognize that that they're in a battle for their souls and um, uh, just like we all are. And uh, so anyway, that's, yeah. that's yeah. Well, it, it was it was a blessed time. Yeah. Wow. And how long were you in? Was it three years? Uh, twenty nine months. Twenty nine months. OK. And I really encourage people to go to Romans 828 com. Romans E I G H T twenty eight and just read the entries. It's it's just encouraging and, and which leads me to the next thing, Philip, and that is persecution or revival. I know you have strong feelings about that. Talk to us about that and what should the church be ready for? Well, you know, the the New Testament, when you read through, it never says that there's gonna be a revival in mm-hmm. the end times. Right. But it does say there will be uh, increasing persecution of believers and uh you know we're we're guaranteed this, and we need to be prepared. We we yes we need to work towards revival. Yes we need to to lead others to Christ, but we need to be prepared to be the, the, for the persecution that's mm-hmm. coming, and it's absolutely inevitable. And we see the way the world is going that the signs are very clear that Jesus is coming back for us, and we need to be prepared. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, and and there's more and more violence in the world, and we turn on the news every day and we see these horrible crimes against people, against children. Uh, I I just I almost can't stand it anymore. Just just turning on the news or looking at an app and seeing what people do to one another. And I'm glad you said what you said about not giving up on people because it's so tempting to think these people are just bent to do that and they don't care and they don't want to hear because even our families don't really want to hear about the Lord. But I'm really glad you said that because um, the time is short and you never know. I mean, the guy that had the, had had the recurring dream in your cell, I mean, that's just incredible. God had been preparing your way. Um, and, of course, you saw none of that coming, but there's plenty of things that we don't see coming. Uh, so I really appreciate that, that you said that, and Christians need to be very realistic about what to expect. And that ties us back into the subject, and that is uh, the LGBTQ agenda and the lobbyists and I think through your case, they're sending a message basically to Americans, don't mess with this agenda. Uh, it's gotten a deep and rotten, rotten, rotten foothold in our country. Now, as far as um, your legal situation, you had some representation, and then you couldn't even get any Christians to represent you. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I couldn't get any of the uh, public interest Christian law firms to, to represent me. Uh, you know, some of them like uh, ACLJ say, well, we don't we don't represent uh, uh, anybody in criminal matters. Well, we're all you know, when persecution hits, we're all going to be charged criminally. We're mm-hmm. all going to be charged. They're, they're going to come up with false charges. I mean, they did that to Jesus. They did that to Paul. You know, it's 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 kind of a ridiculous thing saying, oh, we're only going to handle uh, uh, non-criminal cases. But I, I don't know. I, I think it's probably a fear of because of the uh, the ones representing Janet Jenkins, the plaintiff, uh, is a, so primarily now at Southern Poverty Law Center. They've taken over the case, uh, I think, back in 2013 or something like that. And they've got a whole army of lawyers working on it. They've got, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in their war chest. And I just think it's a fear of of the opposition, a fear of, mm-hmm. of, uh, it's, it's a, it's a difficult case. Yeah, absolutely. And the Southern Poverty Law Center, I want to talk more about them in the second half here. Um, they got started in 1971. Uh, and I think it had to do with fighting the Klan. Is that how, is that how they came about? That's correct. It, it was, uh, it is, and that's how they made their got their initial pot of gold is winning some key court cases, mm-hmm. and uh, you know the, it turns out that they became uh, eventually a very corrupt and fraudulent organization. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you want to start getting into that right now, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, they are. I would say the nemesis of Christians in America, if if you want to label them something, uh, they're they're definitely our enemy. They're a very hate-filled group, and they're a very 
uh, they're just the epitome of hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And it's not just me saying this. It's not just other Christians that are saying this. But the liberal media and the liberal press has also labeled them such as well. So they're just, uh, they're formidable. Yeah, yes, definitely. And I had heard of them for many, many years, but I didn't realize, uh, as you say in your article, you have an article here called Southern Poverty Lawsuit Against Child Protectors could lead to normalizing adult child sex. And you say here, um, it's become one of the most egregious examples of hypocrisy ever seen. They're bankrolling and representing the plaintiff in the civil suit against me, my company, uh, and my daughter. Um, uh, It says, journalist John Edgerton, writing for The Progressive, called SPLC's founder Morris Dees a super salesman and master fundraiser who viewed civil rights work mainly as a marketing tool for bilking gullible northern liberals. According to his former business partner, Dee's self-described lifetime goal was to make a pile of money. And then you say, just take, for example, the hundreds of millions of dollars in in donor money stashed away in offshore accounts. Top executives are paid close to 400000 a year or more. Congress has called for investigations. Where did, Philip, where has that gone? Because I'm guessing that that's not going to happen because they do have tax-exempt status. Is that correct? Yeah, it was, uh, well, Jeff Sessions, when he was there, uh, he was calling for Tom Cotton more recently. Uh, I think there's been others as well, some some of the, the House members. Uh, I, I frankly, I don't know where it's gone. But, uh, you know, when you, you, you have the liberals and the rhinos basically controlling Congress, uh, yeah. you don't expect it to go anywhere. Well, that's absolutely true. And I, I wouldn't expect it to go anywhere because, like you said, they are well-funded. Um, the head of the rival group, Southern Center for Human Rights, said in a 1996 letter to Morris Dees, uh, the founder, you are a con man. <laughs> and he, say, he explained, because of your failure to respond to the most desperate needs of the poor and powerless, despite your millions upon millions, your fundraising techniques, the fact that you spend so much, accomplish so little, and promote, promote yourself so shamelessly. And they even teamed up with CARE, C-A-I-R, which is the Council on American Islamic Relations, which uh, is under investigation for funding Islamic terror groups. Um in calling for defunding hate groups who oppose or expose the Islamization of America, proving their claim that far right extreme quote far right extremism was a greater threat than radical Islamic extremism. Well, they're not talking about us, are they, Philip? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. Yeah, yeah, and you know they have this. They have this. If you go to the website, they have this hate map, and yeah. where they identify uh, organizations all over the country. Now, some of them truly are hate groups, but included amongst those are many Christian organizations like the Family Research Council mm-hmm. that, you know, are, are are good organizations. And they want to label, you know, Christians as, as haters when, in fact, they are the haters. Yeah. And, you know, they label us as hate because we consider... Uh, you know, we, we, we hate sin, and they love sin. Mm-hmm. And so there's this huge dichotomy between, uh, you know, they're, they're, they are defending the right to sin, and we are saying God hates sin, and we need to repent. Yeah. So there's obviously a—there's no middle ground there. Right. And uh, Wow. Well, so, hate, hate is big business, you know, and, and like you said, it's just the height of hypocrisy— They call the right wing haters, and yet they are the ones doing the hating. And actually, what we're going to talk about when we come back is criminalizing Christianity and and their hate list. And I want to read a quote when we come back about their hate list when it comes to parents who are rising up and defending children's rights against school boards. Uh, This is Mary Danielson. Um, You're listening to Stand Up for the Truth. We're talking to Philip Zodiatis about... um, an incredible story that that uh, really altered his life, but see, definitely see God's hand in all of these things. So we're going to talk more about the Southern po- Poverty Law Center as we come back, and and what's next on this horrible agenda. So um, stay with us, and uh, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Be sure to check out the upcoming tab at StandUpForTheTruth.com. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth. My name is Mary Danielson. I'm speaking to Philip Zodiades today, um, Christian businessman um, who is always, 
you know, been fighting behind the scenes to help Christians, conservatives, uh, help fight, um, help the helpless, fight injustice and corruption. Um, you've, you've been a busy, busy man. And of course, uh, the devil has you in his sights. Um, you've had a tremendous amount of legal bills, right? How, how much have you uh, incurred up to this point? Uh, I'm not sure of the exact amount, but it's well over a million dollars. Wow, wow. Uh, yeah, so, and you do have a site, uh, 419, just the numbers, 419fund.com, and it's a, it's a Christian um, fundraising site, is that correct? It's a crowdfunding site, and, uh, yeah, and, and so you have to scroll down once you get on their homepage, you'll see my picture, and, and click on that, and it'll it'll the article is there that you're talking about and uh also some other background information okay. and there is an opportunity to donate there okay and this is this is going to be an ongoing thing for you i mean it's your your home and you're free again but this will be ongoing legally speaking oh yeah the 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 civil suit probably won't happen for another year and a half two mm. years i mean it's, wow. it's down the road a ways Wow. I mean, it's 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 what we're facing now. So it's mm-hmm. it hasn't happened yet. OK. OK. And I know that Lighthouse Trails Research has been talking about this since about 2010 or so. And they've been keeping, you know, track of this and, and letting people know what's going on. And so we appreciate them for doing that. And people can go to Lighthouse Trails Research dot com and you can read up on this case and you can read the history of it. If you're interested, so uh, 419fund.com. And then, again, the the prison diary, which is really encouraging um, your life, I mean, as, as you knew it for those two and a half years. Romans 8, E-I-G-H-T, 28, the numbers, dot com. We were talking about um, really the political ramifications of all of this and the ramifications for our lives as Christians, uh, because this is just one. I mean, I think you've been at the epicenter of something that probably none of us actually saw coming, but it's just a concrete thing. And the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, um, they're the ones that have been bankrolling this. They have a lot of money. Um, they have, they have uh, how many lawyers do they have? Uh, so much uh, power that they have just because of an agenda of the gay rights. And they have a hate list. And the hate list has to do with people on the right that they feel are destroying the LGBTQ agenda. And here's what they say about the parents who come against these school boards and others, but specifically them. These groups, this is Southern Poverty Law Center, these groups denigrate lessons on diversity and inclusion. They spew homophobic and transphobic speech in the name of protecting their children's innocence, disregarding and disrespecting children in the LGBTQ community. They ban reading materials that they deem inappropriate which almost always happens to be LGBTQ or non-white in subject matter. They embrace racist and nationalist ideology, claiming to want the teaching of America's accurate history in schools, but label the true harsh history of the country as unpatriotic and unsuitable for children. So that's that's what we're up against. That's the war. And, you know, Philip, there's been there have been wars now, I think, in just about every city. I don't mean literal wars, obviously, but culture wars against the children, drag shows, and parades and all that. It used to be just uh, during a certain part of the year, and now it's all year long. And I think a lot of families, and they call it family friendly, right? A lot of families are very uh, disturbed by that. Um, have you had any experience with that sort of thing where you live? Is it fairly common near you too? Well, it's all over. I mean, it's it's. I mean, they're they're pushing their agenda everywhere in in, in the world, not just the United States. And it's uh, it's it's you know this is going back to the Southern Poverty Law Center. Why they're so hypocritical is I mean they, back a few years ago I think it was actually while I was in prison. Morris Dees, the founder, and and the I think the uh, one or two other individuals were forced to resign because the liberal media came after them mm-hmm. uh, big time because of of this very issue, their hypocrisy. They were founded as a civil rights organization and, you know, supposedly protecting the innocent and, and looking after their civil rights. But in, there was 
more than 20 accusations against the founder and against other leaders uh, that they were racist and they were sexual predators. And the board for 20 years, the board of directors of Southern Poverty Law Center refused to deal with these issues until it actually hit the media and the Washington mm-hmm. Post and New York Times, uh, all these liberal publications came after them. And, and so the, they finally, uh, you know, uh, fired them and, and, uh, now they're trying to uh, supposedly take on a new leaf, but yet they still are. Their their main agenda is to push all these sick, sick things that are happening to our children. So I really don't see much change. They're mm-hmm. just it's, it was just you know they they put on another mask, and we've I would love to see them. Uh, defeated in in the court of public opinion, and too few mm-hmm. Christians really know about what they're all about. Mm-hmm. But in this case, their true their true purpose in this lawsuit of Jenkins versus Miller is to normalize, legitimize, and eventually eliminate any legal constraints to mm-hmm. adults having sexual relations with children. Mm-hmm. And the other thing they're try, they're trying to do is to obliterate religious conscience as a legal defense. Mm-hmm. And th- this is why wow. uh, the abuse has been swept under the rug in this case. If if you look, whenever it's reported in on their website or in the liberal media, they never mention the abuse. But that's really the main issue in this whole case. It's nothing to do with gay rights. It's the abuse of a child. Mm. And it needs to be forced front and center as the main issue. Yeah. It's imperative that... SPLC and their evil agenda towards our children is defeated both in court and in the court of public opinion, mm. and especially the courtroom in, in fe- the federal courtroom in Vermont, where we're he- all headed. So, wow. well, and now during the course of these last many years, have have people actually have people contacted you who may be facing similar situations? Because I suppose people would maybe read about your story and seek you out. Are you aware of any other? Christians who are being railroaded in this manner? Uh, I'm, you know, I've, well, when I was in prison, I got a lot of letters from mm-hmm. different people. And I would get letters from uh, women and men who said they were abused as children. And so they really appreciated what I was doing and, and the stand that I took. And so I, I got a lot of that sort of thing. Well, not a lot, but I did get that. Um, but uh, no, I don't know of of, of many others that, or any others really that have faced such an injustice. Um, but that's not to say it's it's not coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was really their uh, their case, their precedent setting case. You know, okay. Southern Poverty Law Center, Morris Dees said. Uh, that they only take precedent-setting cases. Mm. And so why are they messing with this case? You know, the, what's so precedent-setting about this case at, at this point in time? It, mm-hmm. it, the only thing that we can figure out is that it it's going to normalize or legitimize adult child sex in America. Mm-hmm. And... They want free reign and legitimate access to our children for their own sexual pleasure. Uh, You know, parental rights are totally being rewritten in this country. And we see this with the utilization of of our children, Uh, you know, saying that if a child who's a minor, they can't make decisions as to whether they're uh, you know, they want to become an, a member of the opposite sex. I mean, this is it's it's just it's unconscionable. And 20, 25 years ago, nobody would ever mm-hmm. believe that this was going to happen in our country or in the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's it's going to be coming through the courts. But, the, you know, they break down the walls slowly or they pick the lock, um, like in, in the case of your uh, case, just bringing this out front, setting precedents so they can look back and say, well, the precedents was set here or there. And that was my next question for you is uh, SPLC, are they, and maybe you don't know the answer to this, but are they behind a lot of these um, 
um, cases or, or, you know, saying, well, the parents can't know. I mean, who is setting that policy? This Philip, it seemed to come out of nowhere, setting some sort of oh, they're policy. They're absolutely behind it. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Yeah, they were, they, were at the, they were the ones that sued the state of Alabama just recently. Fortunately, they lost on this whole issue of uh, uh, changing the, you know, uh, what do they call it? a child having the right to uh, to become the opposite sex, which we know that can never happen. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, ch- ch- in, in in actuality, children are losing all rights. <coughs> so, hmm. excuse me, mm-hmm. it's really a travesty, and it's part of the reason is because Christians are silent. Yeah. You know, we're not making our voice heard. And we need to create a firestorm in this country, not just among Christians, but the, the, the public in general. I mean, most people, the vast majority of people are not in agreement of what's going on. Right. And we need to come out and say so. We need to write our congressmen and we need to take a stand. Yes, absolutely. And, and I, I'm really surprised at where this has all gone, you know, having been around a while myself I, I'm trying to juxtapose this into my childhood and all the things that are going on mm-hmm. against children. I'm thinking, oh, my parents, if they could see this or hear this, they, they would be dumbfounded that it's gone this far. And now trafficking, I, I think we were talking yesterday that the, the Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison 94 corridor is one of the worst in the country for trafficking. And just on the news, Fox News had about a, a young gal who was nine. She was at um, camping with her parents and she was taken uh, from her bicycle right there in a, in a park, um, a, a campground. And now that ended well. But, Philip, how many are not ending well? Uh, do, do you know, and I, I probably should have looked this up, how many children are actually missing and suspected to be, I, maybe we can't know this, in this trafficking system? Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure of the figure, but I'm sure it's hundreds of thousands and part of the problem with this whole issue is because there are so many in positions of power in this country. Part of our bureaucracy, part of our court system, part of our political system, uh, part of our law enforcement, and they are they are involved in this. They are involved in pedophilia, and it's just a tragedy that it is it, it is really on their watch that they are allowing this to happen. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying there aren't good people that are involved in in, uh, opposing this, but it is allowed to go on. And now it's being normalized through our case and legitimized. And who knows when it will be even legalized. Mm -hmm. And nobody would have thought this, like I said, 10, 20 years ago. But Mm -hmm. nobody would have thought that it would be, uh, you know, that we would force the mutilization of children. Yeah on them and it, it, this is just a it's, it's just a travesty it really is moms and dads have to be so vigilant when my daughter was young all, all of a sudden we see uh, milk carton children that was the thing in back in the 80s when she was young and it, it struck fear in our hearts because that wasn't the world that we were accustomed to you talk about in this article again this is a great article southern poverty lawsuit against child protectors could lead to normalizing adult child sex and you talk about a woman who called up Dr. Phil and explained um, her story of captivity um, and just the horrible things that happened to her. And that, and then you go to, um, when talking about her, she had a horrible, horrible uh, childhood and, and just hunted like an animal. And you talk about social elites and you talk about um, the, the Jeffrey Epsteins and all that. And we've kind of forgotten about that. And it was the subject of a lot of joking. And we don't really know what happened there, but... Um, uh, Philip, what can you tell us about this? I mean, I think, how can we keep this at the forefront of our minds, this Epstein thing? And you talk about uh, many rich and powerful that he helped. Um, what are we going to do if this keeps up? You know, what I'm saying is is how in the world can we fight that when it is the rich, famous, you know, government officials and that sort of thing? And will there ever be anyone understanding whatever happened with Jeffrey Epstein? Will anybody come to justice? Well, you know, <laughs> I can't help but but come back to the the fact that the answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And, and it's, you know, we need to be living, walking testimonies on a daily basis, wherever we are. And uh, that G- Jesus is the only answer. And um, 
you know, I'm not saying we, we don't need to fight these things and we don't need to make people aware. But if we do that and sacrifice the fact that, uh, you know, it's our lives that are going to make the difference in this nation and around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's very, very important that uh, that we live for Christ every day and we are a witness for him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's unfortunate that evil has become so prevalent even among our leaders. But uh, what do you expect when you have such a corrupt society and, and evil is actually put on a pedestal? And, you know, uh, we sacrifice our kids on the altar of Satan. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And the media, <clears throat> we're amazed sometimes at the things that come up in TV ads or, you know, when we watch or things, subject matter, it's common you know, the, the homosexual agenda is common in across the board in everything, and you don't even see it coming. Commercials, everything. Uh, and then the kids go to school. It's in the library books. It's in the classroom. It almost seems like it's – you can't put this toothpaste back in the tube, obviously. And we're getting much closer right. to a wicked society. And like you said, the Lord – Coming back is really the only solution. It's going to get a lot worse. You say in this article, as sick, as incredulous as the subject matter seems, every word is true. It just shows how far from sick our society has gotten. We're paying the price today for allowing the removal of God from every semblance of society and promoting an attitude that says, if it feels good, it's okay. Um, and you say the strength in the adversary's deeds of darkness and what can, be, what can be more despicable than those perpetrated on children is in keeping them hidden making sure no one knows about them. About them. This, is what, um, this is what is happening in this particular case. Mainstream media has only reported on the story from the biased angle that Lisa and those who helped her and Isabella are kidnappers because they are LGBTQ-hating people. But this is anything but the truth. Those of us who helped her and her mom did it for one reason only. We saw an endangered child. Boy, you really did lay down your life for the situation, Philip, and... Uh, um, we just need to be on the alert. Our adversary prowls around like a roaring, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And my heart breaks. And for women, too, because there's a war on women um, as far as men, uh -huh. quote, unquote, becoming women. And we're being homogenized. I mean, you know, this is your identity, your gender. Uh, everything about you is being homogenized so that everyone has the same value system, you know, diversity, equity, inclusivism, and that sort of thing. And, Philip, unfortunately, I think a lot of the churches are not warning people. Is there something that the churches can do to warn people about these times, to warn parents and equip them to be prepared for these things getting darker and darker? Because I don't see that happening in a lot of cases. No, no, I agree with you, and I, I think I think that needs to happen. I think we need to be prepared for persecution. We need, we, we are, we are, I have no doubt in the end times, and like you say, things are going to get worse and worse. And it's it's God will carry us through, and God will mm -hmm. rescue us from this. But uh, we 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 have to face what's happening. We have to stand up to sin, and we cannot compromise in whatever we do. And it's so easy to just sit back and say, "Well, this doesn't apply to me. You know, this doesn't affect me." And uh, you right. know, I'm, I'm not. I, I, there's nothing I can do, but we have to do something. We have to speak out. Uh, yeah. Parental rights are being rewritten. They're being trampled on. And uh, our rights as Christians are being trampled on. Our, our, our uh, you know, rights to, to use our religious conscience as a legal defense is basically being thrown out the window. And so we have to do something to take a stand mm -hmm. and... Uh, you know, we have to rely on the strength of the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm I'm glad that God chose me to be in this fight. And uh, you know, we're supposed to rejoice in our persecutions and our circumstances. And we need to, you know, I need people to stand up with me, frankly. And uh, I, whoever can come alongside and and kind of hold my arms up as mm -hmm. we fight this behemoth, uh, I would certainly appreciate it. Yes, and I'm, I'm really grateful for your story. Um, the gal at Lighthouse Deb uh, talked to me about your story, and I'd been following it to some degree. 
Um, and I just am so grateful that you're telling your story because uh, that's how things get out there and people get a good idea or a marker put in place on where we are at. This is the days of Noah, the days of Lot. It's just been horrible. Now, you um, did you seek a pardon um, for uh, your your felony? Did, how did that work? Did you seek a pardon? I think it was with Trump. I did. I was told that it was on his desk and uh, he was going to sign it. But the Department of Justice lawyers that he uh, consulted with uh, talked him into not signing it. So, um, but yes, mm. I, I was not pardoned. Okay. Uh, has Lisa sought anything like that? I, I do not know, oh, really. Okay. All right. All right. And she's... Um, this this nightmare is somewhat done for her and Isabella. I presume has has gotten on with her life as an adult. That's what I understand. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow, what an amazing story! What an amazing time to be alive. And and as we've said here many times, you know, the church is still here for a reason, and we're here for a reason. And and so we need to be busy. We need to keep moving. Um, is there anything we've left out, Philip? We just have a couple minutes left. Uh, what can people do now? Do you suggest that they just write their congressman? I think you mentioned that briefly. What is the best well, thing to do? Well, most important, most importantly, is to pray. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would appreciate prayers for our family. I would appreciate prayers for this case. I would appreciate mm-hmm. pr- prayers to that this uh, these evil people would be brought down, and uh, <laughs> that God would continue to supply all our needs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You say at the end of the article, write or email your congressman, insisting that he or she take a vocal public stand on this issue and denouncing. SPLC for this despicable attempt to use federal court system to legitimize pedophilia and obliterate the last of moral and religious conscience as a legal defense, sacrificing the rights of our children to child molesters. Congress has been eerily silent, like you say, making them complicit. Also, um, I would encourage people to, to spread your story here. It says tell others what's happening, get them involved uh, to help you tell others. Um, read the article, spread it around. Southern poverty lawsuit against child protectors could lead to normalizing adult child sex. That's the article. 419fund.com if you want to help Philip out. And Romans 8, E I G H T 2 8 to read about his prison diary. Just an amazing, amazing story. And uh, I love I love your testimony in this, Philip, because you really um, relied on the Lord in this. And I've heard people say when they go through a deep um, trial like that, I. I wouldn't be who I am if not for that. And do you feel that way? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the the passage of Scripture you read at the beginning, uh, Romans 5, beginning Romans 5, I mean, that, that perfectly says that, uh, you know, and I, I kept on my locker the whole time I was in prison, hmm. uh, 1 Peter 5, 10. And, you know, it's, it's absolutely, uh, you know— God will give us the strength through the power of the Holy Spirit to go through whatever we have to go through. We cannot live in fear. We cannot mm. be afraid. We have to uh, live boldly and uh, for the Lord, and we have to be a bold witness for Him and not live in fear. And it's fear that is the detriment of so many Christians, mm. and we, we've got to put that beside us. We've got to let the Holy Spirit take control of us and give us the boldness like they had in Acts when Peter and John, you know, they defied uh, the authorities that said, you know, stop naming the name of Jesus. We can't do that. We have to be bold like they were. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's going to come a day when maybe we can't meet in our churches anymore, or maybe we can't even do this, what we're doing here on the radio or um, social media. We've already seen so much censorship on social media telling us what we can say and what we can't say which is disturbing enough, and I think we weren't even ready for that when COVID came along. Uh, So there will be some crisis around the corner, and uh, the UN and the global elites and the powers that be will find another way to ramp all this up. Uh, It's disturbing, but I love how you said that. We have to be bold, because what are we going to do? And we're going to give an account for the things and the opportunities that we had to speak the truth. And um, there's a war, right, Philip? A war for children, a war for you and I, a war for those men in that... uh, that uh, prison that you were in and um we got to fight the fight. better yeah right right we need to fight the good fight philip thank you so much 
for being with me today and just letting people Thank know you. that this is going on. And and again, 419fund.com, Romans 8, E-I-G-H-T 28 com. Read that prison diary. It's very, very interesting. We got the rest of the week coming up tomorrow. Ruth Christian will be a replay of Ruth and, and my discussion on inductive Bible study. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you don't want to miss that. Thursday, Usama Dakdak. Talk about Islam. Friday, Todd Nettleton. Speaking of persecution, voiceofthemartyrs.com. Todd Nettleton will be back with us. He's a regular, always an incredible encouragement. And uh, when you read these stories of persecuted brethren and what the Lord does for them, it should make us bold. Therefore, my my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Have a great day on purpose. (music) 